if you take your eyes off your opponent, you're not respecting them and you are compromising your ability to maintain your own safety and well-being at the expense of thinking that the situation couldn't possibly go wrong. That's that's where you're wrong, my friend. <laughs> Welcome to Too Legitimate to Quit, instantly actionable small business strategies with a pop culture spin. I am your host, Annie P. Ruggles, and my guest today is the brilliant Jonathan Pritchard. Jonathan Pritchard is a highly sought after consultant and speaker specializing in the area of applied psychology in life and business. His client list includes Fortune 500 companies like BP, State Farm, United Airlines, and more. He is the founder of the international consulting company, The Hellstrom Group, which has trained teams to improve their sales, negotiation, and presentation skills on six out of seven continents. His expertise comes from his background traveling the world as a mentalist, a unique type of entertainer specializing in mind reading tricks. The applied psychology he uses on stage in Vegas, on TV, and online gives him an edge off stage as well. He is the author of several books focused on psychology, motivation, self improvement, and more. Jonathan, I am so excited to have you here. You know the question. The question is what do small business owners need to focus on this week? Themselves. <laughs> Ooh. Well, there's an answer. Tell me more. Well, I am a huge believer in not giving people tactics when the problems they're facing are themselves. Oh, yeah. And small business owners, the main roadblocks they have are the beliefs they have about what they should be doing, what they should be spending time on, what they are worthy of. There's, there's an infinite number of personal issues that lead to business problems. And then they would come to me to try to have some business strategy or clever tactic or, hey, can you help me improve the click-through rate on my Facebook ads? when the root cause is themselves. Yes. So yeah, every every business issue that a small business owner is facing is really a them issue. Amen. Hallelujah. Completely agree. And And that's how I wound up doing what I'm doing now is because I was in marketing and branding strategy and I loved it so much. But if you asked me if I had a mindset issue, I would have said no. I mean, I would have worked through my stuff. I'm a lifetime therapy person. Like I would have been like, no, I'm fine. But I did have a huge me problem, which is that I had sales avoidance. And I thought that throwing marketing band-aids at the problem would take me across the finish line of selling so I wouldn't have to ask. And that was completely untrue. And when I looked at my clients first, because I saw it in them first, I thought, well, why the heck are they so afraid of sales? And then I realized they were modeling me. And I was like, oh, shit, <laughs> this is something that starts with me. It's a me problem. So in my own life, in my own trajectory, in my own business, and, and how I've gotten to this point, plus with my client works, I am very much a living example of what you just said, because I thought my mindset was on lock. It wasn't. Right. Right. And and you just went straight to the heart of what I like working on is sales, because sales is kind of the pivot point between your marketing and your delivery. And you are spending so much time, effort and energy being in front of the right people in the right way at the right time to get the right people on the Zoom call for the sales conversation. 
and then you bungle that process, then now you have to have twice as much marketing dollars to make up for your sales ineptitude. Yes. And if you know how to go through the sales process while building and establishing trust to deliver awesome product, well, then every extra deal you close is like multiplying your ad spend. So there, there's so many people who have those mindset issues around sales. They're worried about the, the lead is going to ask them about this thing, or they're worried about this objection, or they're worried about this thing. So then they go on for 15 minutes, proactively trying to diffuse what isn't a problem. And then that lead is going, boy, they're spending a lot of time talking about this problem. I I never thought about it, but I guess, yeah, that is a problem. So now I'm really worried about this thing. And now I have this objection. And then the salesperson is going, see, everybody has this objection. That's why I'm so worried about it. And, And you are the source of that problem. Amen. Hallelujah. Again, we project our money issues, especially onto our clients. So all objections, yes. And there is a huge difference between handling an objection proactively and creating an objective, an objection in the mind of the prospect, right? Like doing exactly what you said. We're like, wow, they're really hitting hard that this is an important an expensive investment. Like I thought it was pretty reasonably priced, but you're right. Maybe I should do more comparative shopping. No, no, run. No, no. But at the same point, like it's with money objections. So often, if we think what we are offering is expensive, we apologize for that when we name the price, right? We're like, no, I know that you could go around the internet and see that my competitors are charging less, but I think it's because I deliver more value. Hush, that's your wallet, right? That's mm-hmm. your business. Yep. I, I love it when somebody goes, man, that's twice as expensive as anybody else I've talked to. And I go, good. That's great. We'll never, ever be your cheapest option. And I go to bed every night knowing that I'm your best option. And I was the cheapest option for years. Right. Yep. And guess what? I ate the cheapest food and slept in the cheapest bedding and had the cheapest lifestyle on top of my burnout for years. And it wasn't even all monetary stuff. I was burned out as hell. Exactly. Because I had put my brain in a bargain basement. Yep. And it never should have been there. So I love that. I always talk about accessibility over affordability because accessibility is more actionable and affordability is totally relative. So I love that. One thing I really want to ask you about, especially because of the nature of your work, I get asked all the time in selling spaces whether or not I think selling is a manipulative act. And I have my own answer for that that I will share on some other show some other time, but this is about you, not about me. What is your relationship with this idea of manipulation? Do you think that we have to manipulate people to get into their minds and move them along? Do you think that that's a bad thing? If so. My beginning point is that I work with the best of the best. People who are already delivering world-class products, services, whatever. So if you don't have the best whatever, then please ignore this. Work on that first. Once you know you're the best in the world of what you do, then listen to the rest of this. There's a landscape of manipulation. And there are two axes. One is who's benefiting from this interaction? Yes. On this end, it's you at the expense of the other person. The other end is everybody benefits from this interaction. You, them, their family, your family, their clients, your clients, everybody in kind of a a pond ripple effect, secondary, tertiary. Mm -hmm. It's a fractal benefit. Right. Okay. So there's that. Then the vertical is, what are you trying to change? Their belief 
or their behavior. So those there those aren't separate things. It's actually kind of a continuum. Yeah. So if you change their belief, the change to their behavior, if you change their behavior, change their belief. But Absolutely. just for sake of illustration, assume they're separate. Okay. So if I am trying to change your behavior to my benefit at your expense, that is coercion. Yes. That's me using a, a, a Glock to steal your purse. That benefits me at your expense. I don't care what you think. I don't care how you feel about it. All I care about is what you're doing, and that's giving me your purse. Mm -hmm. So that's coercion. Right. If I am trying to withhold information or manage the narrative by not filling in all the details that you need to make a fully informed decision, that allows you to come to the wrong beliefs about reality. And therefore, you are going to make a decision at my benefit at your expense, because if you had known all the details, then you would not have agreed to it. That is what manipulation is. On the opposite side, if everybody's benefiting from this interaction and I'm trying to change your behavior, that is influence. I'm trying to influence you to come with me to this restaurant because I, I know it has that thing that you like, it has the thing I like. This is the best option available to us. Just go there and you'll see. If I'm trying to change your beliefs, then that is persuasion. Mm -hmm. So that's the landscape of influence, persuasion, coercion, manipulation. I love that. And to the point of does everybody need to be manipulated? Human beings are not rational creatures. We make intuitive decisions that make sense within the framework of our existing experience that we then rationalize later and justify with logic. But that doesn't mean that it's an empirically logical question right. or decision to make, right? So if we were perfectly logical creatures, then you could provide facts and information and that would help them change their mind. Yes. But the internet has proven to us that information availability does not equal logical decision making. <laughs> That's true and sad and true. We've got all the information we could ever hope for. Yeah. And it has zero effect on people's decision making. Oh, absolutely. And 100%. If, if, if your lead knew what the real problem is, they wouldn't need you to solve anything because they would have fixed it already. So by virtue of them having the issue that you can fix, they're telling you that they don't understand what you know. Mm -hmm. So you're asking them to understand what took you a lifetime to understand to recognize it just because you showed up on Zoom? No, nobody is that kind of a mind reader. People will say that, oh, I don't think I'm a mind reader. I don't think other people are a mind reader. And then wonder why the lead doesn't recognize that they're the best. Well, it's because your persuasive skills are absolute garbage. Your communication skills, a hot mess. You can't even explain what you do to a stranger. Why in the world would your perfect client recognize it? Like you're not even clear about what you do. Yep. So you need to be ultra clear about why you help other people, then work really hard at putting it in terms that your lead will understand, not just the way that you've learned to say it to your industry friends. Yes, 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 yes. I'm getting whiplash from nodding my head so much. It is like starting to ache a little and I'm not even mad, but you're totally right because I see a lot of things and I'm not dog in marketing. Again, I love marketing, but to your point from before, make your marketing worth it by getting out of your own way and asking for the sale, right? Double down on it, don't botch it. But, but you know, one of the things that we get so hung up on is even just, that idea of like, well, if I nail my elevator pitch or my 30 second spiel 
or if I have a good uh, impact statement, then I officially can check the box on knowing what I do, why I do it, who I serve, how I serve them, and how I serve them better than anybody else. And yeah, no, that means that you strung some lovely words together. Again, it's valuable, but if you don't internalize the why, if you don't understand why you're doing it, if you're letting the air out of your own balloon, I see this all the time. I'd love to get your opinion on this, where we do these kind of micro apologies. Like, I think my program could be good for you. I think my program could be good for you is not a strong enough statement to get someone to invest and change their life. We don't want to overpromise, but also what is that could doing in there other than to soften the blow of the rejection that we assume is coming? Right. So that to me says that a person isn't really walking in and owning the personal connection to that elevator pitch that they're saying is their thing. Do you agree? I do. And I take it even farther that it's being afraid of envy. Ooh, what? Tell me more about this. You're blowing my mind. Most people aren't comfortable with other people's success, they're envious of successful people and hate anybody who embodies success that they're not capable of. Mm. If you stand up with your back straight and say, I am the best in the world at what I do. There's literally nobody better than me. You're not going to make a lot of friends. No. Because most people can't handle excellence. And as you grow up, you get beaten down for being excellent. So you learn to preemptively protect yourself from that envy and undersell what you can do, who you are, and how you do it. So it's not that they're just afraid of their thing or it's rejection. It's that they're uncomfortable being excellent because most people can't handle it. And therefore, hate what they will never be, which is excellent. Holy cow. Holy cow. So we let the air out of our own balloon to knock ourselves out of our personal excellence so we can blend into the crowd. But then we try to throw marketing problems at it or marketing band-aids at it. So we stand out in the crowd. And that's exactly what you were talking about at the beginning, which is that if your mind's not right, your funnel doesn't matter. Exactly. So get used to being the best. Damn. All right, let's play with this. Jonathan Pritchard, what are you the best in the whole world at? Reading minds. Frick yeah. Tell me more. For 20 years, I've literally traveled the world. I've entertained the troops overseas. I have worked with Fortune 500 clients. When I was 13 years old, I got paid 200 bucks an hour to do magic tricks for a company summer picnic. Hell yes. I, I know how to read minds. There's fewer than a handful of human beings alive that could even come close to doing what I do. It's all applied psychology, showmanship, and having the moxie to just pull it off. So I've done that on stage. I realized that the exact same psychological techniques that worked for every single audience, no matter where in the world I was performing, applied to the audience, applied on stage, and applied off stage for me to build my own successful touring career. So I saw so many thought leaders and thought, wait a minute. Can they stand on stage in front of a thousand perfect strangers and communicate so well that those thousand people think that they could read minds? No, then I understand thought leadership better than they do, which is why I'm the world's greatest thought leader. And I can prove it. I challenge any thought leader to a live demonstration in front of a thousand strangers and see who can influence more effectively who can get an audience to believe what you want them to believe, who can deliver a message more effectively. Yeah, I'll win that every single time. Oh yeah, here's the thing. I am freaking phenomenal at what I do, but I'm not taking you on. Shit, no. <laughs> uh-uh. 
Uh, uh, no. I can no. I can get people to do impossible things that they know for sure they can't do it. And in two minutes, they just accomplished it. Literally. I can demonstrate that again and again and again. And that's behavior and belief simultaneously. You're getting them outside your paradigm, outside their paradigm. It's, it's that their strategies make sense within the framework of their experience, mm -hmm. however, are not in alignment with reality. And that's why they're not working. Once you understand what's at play, which is the human operating system and how it interacts with reality, then you can design strategies that are infinitely more effective. So if you've been spending a decade trying to solve this problem, that's usually a good indicator that your strategy is not in alignment with reality and a good strategy could fix it way faster than you ever believed possible. I love that spectrum too, Stra strategy to reality. And I want to go back to this brilliant recipe that you outlined for yourself, which is psychology, showmanship, and moxie. Yep, that's it. That's so totally key on, you know, what I understand of you and, and your work and your tours and all of these things. Also, 13-year-old magic trick you and 13-year-old tap dancing me would have been really good buddies. We oh, would yeah. have had a good hustle going. We would have worked that circuit because I was a child actor. So we would have been right there. But, you know, psychology, I don't want even want to waste time on this talking about why psychology is important. Your own psychology, buyer psychology, human psychology, sociology, it is people just trust us. It's critically important. And, and I, but I want to give just credence and weight to those latter two that you mentioned, because I love them. And I don't think they're talked about nearly enough, which is showmanship and moxie. And a lot of people, what do you think comes first? Is it a chicken egg situation? What comes first, showmanship or moxie? Does showmanship beget moxie? Does moxie beget showmanship? Are they cousins? What's the relationship there? Competence comes first, then confidence, then showmanship. Showmanship is understanding the craft of presenting something, Yes. of maintaining engagement, of maintaining attention being able to skillfully direct somebody's attention to something that they find interesting. So creating those situations where you're creating those areas of interest and the audience will discover them themselves. That's the applied psychology angle of it. Yep. And you need to embody to a certain degree what their expectation of who you should be should be. So that you fit that frame and they kind of go, oh, okay, I get it. Yeah, I'm not, my brain's not going to rebel against this. This makes sense to me. We don't have to get past some kind of barrier I'm putting up because I'm confused. Right, right. It makes sense. And from the world of magic and magicians, there is a, a hugely influential magician who would say, confusion is not magic. If your audience is saying, I don't know what happened, some stuff. I, I'm not, I don't know. That's not magic. No, it's magic is that woman just floated. Yeah. Very clear, simple yep. to understand, but impossible. And the moxie is to me, I think, yeah, moxie is the important one because it's what most people lack, which is just having the gumption to ask for success, to go up to your mentor and make yourself valuable to them somehow. Ask for the opportunity. Yep. Most people are too scared of the no to have the gumption to ask for the yes. Mm. And as my mom told me when I was a kid, if you never ask, the answer is always no. Amen. Hallelujah. Again, I teach my clients that too. We reject ourselves before we put ourselves out there for rejection. That's what happens when we don't sell. We assume the no, we get the no right? We don't ask, we don't get. It's that simple, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, I think it's totally right. Confusion is not magic. What what weirdly came to my mind is there was a day when I went to this fabulous place in Chicago. There's my Midwestern Chicago accent just came out too. Fabulous. Uh, this fabulous place in Chicago. 
uh, called the Chicago Magic Lounge. And yes. I'm super lucky I got to go up on stage. And do you do you remember who it was? No, but I'll find out and I'll email you. Good. But he brought me up and he was doing this amazing sleight of hand with tissues. And he was crumpling them up. No, they were just white, like plain white tissue okay. and paper towels. Like some of them were huge. Some of them were small. Got it. But what I didn't know was when he was doing all this sleight of hand right in front of my face. So like I couldn't see it. The whole audience could see it, but I couldn't. And mm -hmm. what he was doing with these tissues is he was putting it on my head. Yep. And so he said, do you know how I'm doing this? Shake your head. Yes or no. And I said, no. And I got avalanched in tissues and he's like, look to the right. And they were on my shoulders. They were in my lap. And he's like, look at my hand, look at my hand the whole time. I was never confused. I was amazed. But to use a term that you brought up before, my attention was so wrapped that I would have believed anything he wanted me to believe until he showed me the mistake in my thinking. I wasn't even aware of what was going on in my own body. I wasn't even aware of the fact that I was literally covered in tissue. And I just remember being like, this is the greatest lesson in the world for how limited our understanding of everything going around us can be in these situations. So that just came up immediately. And I will find out who that guy was because he was incredible. I am so glad that you had that experience. Oh, That's wonderful. I loved it. I'm also just like, anytime I'm in the room around magic at all, like pull me up. I am such a flaily, excited person that like, if you pull something out of my ear, you won't get a, oh, wow, cool. You're going to get me being like, what's that in my brain? Like I freak <laughs> out, but again, that's, great. that's like enthusiasm for having my brain blown and yep. all of us have the potential to blow minds every single day, no matter what the work is that we do. If we're a coach, we're promising transformation. If we're a healer, we're promising cessation of pain. If we're a teacher, we're promising education and advancement. All of those things every day have the capacity to blow a mind as much as a tissue on my head does. But we don't look at that showmanship and we don't step up into moxie. So my question for you on this one is, how is moxie accrued? Hmm. Side note, I I would headline at the Chicago Magic Lounge all the time. Really? I, I lived about half a mile from there. And in Andersonville? Yeah. Yeah. That's wild. Hey neighbor. Yeah. Well, I, I've since moved to North Carolina to be closer to family. Uh, but yeah, that that was home for a long time. I so yeah, I'm I'm so happy to know that you had a, a positive oh, experience every there. Every time I go, I have a blast. That's great. One That's time great. uh we went in and the trick laundromat door, I had my best uh -huh. friend with me. And my best friend is a she she's always like, I'm gonna heckle. And I'm like, No, you're not. She's like, I'm gonna figure it out. And I'm like, No, you're not. Just shush, you're not. So we go in, the very first thing she hits the button to make the door open. And the guy's like, I told you not to touch anything. She's like, I didn't know it was a button. So, yes, we have had many, many, many a great time there. But nice. anyway, nice. I digress. So how is Moxie accrued? Practice, like anything. It can be a skill. I, I'm super introverted. I would rather not talk to people. Yeah. I'd rather be by myself. Um, but I just recognized that the people who asked for what they wanted seemed to be the people that got it yeah. and recognizing that people aren't mind readers. They can't understand what you want. They, they don't get the hints. They don't get the suggestions. They don't know that that was you trying to let them know that you may be, no, you ask for it straight yeah. up point blank, make it very clear, have zero chill. Chill will destroy your success. <laughs> have zero chill. We need to put that on a tote bag. Yeah. I, I am. I have no chill. My, my wife will tell you that I, I have none. I have no nope. chill. Mm -mm. I have zero chill. None. I think that's also really interesting that like you and I are both showy introverts with no chill. We're a very special breed. Right. Mm -hmm. Where like showmanship and introversion are not 
mutually exclusive in a lot of ways they're very much like i'm on and then i'm not and then i'm on and then i'm not right because everybody goes well it's easy for you because you're so extroverted yeah Uh, i could never be good at sales because i'm not an extrovert i'm like stop making excuses stop putting labels on yourself too like enough enough so One thing that I think is so freaking fabulous because we're talking about showmanship and moxie and all of these things today is we got to talk about one of the greatest showmans of all time, Bruce Lee. And today you have come here to give us some moxie showmanship, psychology, mind reading, influence lessons from the 1973 absolute classic Enter the Dragon. Not to be confused with the movie that ripped it off which is the original Mortal Kombat movie from several years later. Don't get them confused like I did. This is the genuine article. Bruce Lee dancing around, being fabulous. Nobody can get a hit on him the entire time. Jonathan, what the heck does any of this have to do with Bruce Lee? All of it. All of it. I The, the part of the movie that I love the most is kind of the beginning when he's at the, the training monastery and he's yes. talking with his his teacher and a lot of his fundamental life philosophy is on display there yes and then his student comes up and he goes sorry mr rope i gotta go Uh, it's time for his lesson and that that one just very short scene packs a lot into it and the the element that sticks with me the most is when he says don't Focus on the finger or you'll miss all the heavenly glory. Right. Don't focus on the finger that points to the moon or you'll miss the freaking moon. Right. And dogs are some of the only animals that understand pointing. If I try to point and my cat will just sniff my finger, it it misses the the food I dropped on the floor. And a lot of people are like that too, where you're just trying to use an example but then they get bogged down in the details of, well, my situation isn't like that. It, no, I'm, I'm not selling widgets. I'm selling doodads. It's, it's not the widgets. It's this, this is the point of the story. And we're like, I don't, I don't see that. I'm like, I, I know. So it's, it's really difficult for people to grasp the lessons instead of getting lost in the details. Absolutely. It's not the features. It's the benefits. Exactly. And all of that is just Kung Fu. Absolutely. I love in that same scene that you mentioned where he's working with his protege um, and he keeps swatting him on the head over Mm -hmm. and over, which I also just thought was great. It reminded me of being a little kid in ballet classes where they'll just come up and hit you. Like, they'll just, okay, cool. But one of the things he said was, never take your eyes off your opponent, even when you bow. And to me, I think that's so interesting because it's not really about being in a state of threat. And and I take karate and I know that it's about being aware of what's happening and 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 knowing what's going on. But I think it's also like we can be reverent and respectful and show up from our own personal place of reverence for how we are the best at what we do simultaneously. If I bow to you, I keep my eyes up because I recognize it's like the true meaning of namaste. The person, the light, the glory, the whatever it is in me acknowledges that same thing in you. It's not about let me be subservient to you. Let me bow down to how great you are. I can match that and help your light to shine simultaneously. And I feel like so many people that I encounter feel like they have to grovel at the feet of the master where you said before, no, go up to your heroes and make yourself useful to them. Exactly. You don't have to compromise yourself to somebody else's benefit. Mm. You don't have to reduce your ability to protect yourself and your interests in relationship with somebody else you can still honor them and respect them without ignoring them or withdrawing. If you disrespect the opportunity, the opportunity might bite you in the ass. Yeah. So if you take your eyes off your opponent, you're not respecting them and you are compromising your ability to maintain your own safety and well-being 
at the expense of thinking that the situation couldn't possibly go wrong. That's, that's where you're wrong, my friend. <laughs> mm-hmm. There's one more thing right in that same beginning scene. So like, if anybody out there is like, I don't like Kung Fu movies, A, reconsider, but B, really give the first like 20 minutes of the film a chance because you're totally right. You get to see his life philosophy at play. You get to see his teachings on the play. You get to see a lot of really amazing Kung Fu in the first like literally one minute. Uh, you'll understand the artistry. But another thing that he says that I want to make sure that we touch on before I let you go is this idea of he says, kick me. And then he says, no, kick me with emotional content. And then the kid kind of freaks out and flails at him. And he's like, I didn't say anger, dude. He didn't say dude. He said, I didn't say anger. I said emotional content. And I think that goes back to that combination of psychology and showmanship, when you're internalizing something so much that you become a beacon of it, that's another term for emotional content. Do you agree? How can we show up with, air quotes, emotional content? Bruce Lee practiced Wing Chun before he created his Jeet Kune Do. Mm-hmm. And Wing Chun is something that I've been practicing nearly every day for almost a decade now. Wow. Uh, a lot of the philosophy that is on show in Enter the Dragon comes from the philosophical and principal framework of Wing Chun. One of the other sayings is that a punch comes from the heart. Mm. And it's it's literal in the sense that it comes from the center and goes direct to your opponent. But it also means that you've got to mean it. You can't half-ass it. You've really got to intend the motion. Your intention moves first, then your body follows. Yes. So if you aren't engaged with the dynamic, you're not in control. So it's not that you are angry. It's just that you are fully engaged in the situation. What you aren't is attached to the outcome. So full engagement, but zero attachment, which sounds like contradictory things. That's just because you're holding on to things too much. It sounds like becoming a Jedi. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. So you, you're you fully engaged with the moment but not trying to force an outcome or attach to this being the only way that I'll be happy with how it goes. If you become attached, then you can be pushed or dragged. Yes. And that means in a literal fashion, it sounds like the woo woo stuff, but it's literally true. And if you try it in sparring, you'll see just how real it is. Yeah. I mean, and we see it also in Enter the Dragon later in the actual tournament when he's fighting O'Hara and O'Hara gets totally pissed. And every time he gets more and more pissed, he gets his ass more and more whooped until ultimately he dies because he can't control his own freaking temper. Exactly. Because Bruce Lee's engaged. Yes, Yes, exactly. But he is unattached. Therefore he can, he can spot opportunity that you wouldn't if you were attached to making only this outcome happen. He also just looks cooler. Yeah, he's he's real good at that. Because he's just in it. And so he's just, Jackie Chan does this too, where you're like, I don't understand how physics works around you. I don't understand why you are weightless and powerful simultaneously, but you make it look so easy because they're so present in it and because they're the best at what they do. So I love that. Okay. Weird question for you now. Let's keep this on the lighter side. We don't have to avenge a death. However, you are invited to a tournament of mentalism to avenge a wrong in your industry, what wrong are you avenging? Somebody sharing secrets with people who haven't worked to understand them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a big ethical 
violation on top of the 19 levels of code, right? Number exactly. one, you just don't do that, right? Exactly. You don't steal jokes, Dane Cook, but you don't tell anybody how the tricks are done unless they're really going to show up with reverence to the art. Otherwise, you're just telling tales. Right. And in a way, it mentalism and, and what I've been doing my whole life can really be boiled down to, okay, what's the trick of playing piano? Well, you just hit the right keys in the right order at the right time. That's it. Mm -hmm. That doesn't really explain how to play Rachmaninoff. No. And if you explain how to play Rachmaninoff to somebody who doesn't even know where middle C is, yeah, that person can't appreciate it. And that is a secret to them, not because it's supposed to be kept from them. No. They literally cannot understand what is being shared with them. Right. They don't understand the power of it, the reverence of it. And I feel that way sometime about clients that are not right for us. We're trying to show the magic. We're trying to show the strategy to people that are not on the same plane that won't get it. And we wind up arm twisting or trying to contort ourselves into their image of what we should be instead of just realizing this person is not ready to receive what I'm giving and therefore they shouldn't receive it. I freaking love that. Jonathan, it has been so incredible having you here. You truly are the best at what you do. What is the best way for our listeners to start a conversation with you? There are several ways, depending on what kind of conversation people want to have with me. If they want to know my thoughts about the 20 most common questions that I get, I put all of that into a book called Think Like a Mind Reader, which is mindset work from the perspective of a professional mind reader. Uh, that's why I'm the world's greatest thought leader. You're, you're going to get insights that your average business guru can't even possibly imagine. So go there if you want to understand the lay of your cognitive landscape. So there's that. If you would like to kind of understand how all of this applies to sales, negotiation, presentation skills, all the fundamental elements of a successful business. I offer a lot of free and paid courses in a community that is Elite University. So if you just go to elite.university, you can join and the courses are available to members there. So I'm hanging out there most of the day, most days that I'm not on the road. So if you want to kind of level up your skills, go there. If you prefer to just hang out in the car with me for a 14 hour car ride and know every single thing that passes my brain, then go follow me on Twitter. That's, that's where I share every stupid thought that comes through my head. And <laughs> you, can, you can find all of those links at jonathanpritchard.me. So all the bazillion projects and irons and fires that I've got going is, is there on that website. Fantastic. So the book, the university and your Twitter, everybody, those are, are going to be all going to be in the show notes. I can't wait to see you on stage someday. I can't wait to have my brain thoroughly blown. It has been such a pleasure having you here. Thanks so much. My pleasure. It was really an honor to be able to, to share my thoughts with you. Everybody, I will be back in just a second with my final thoughts and your homework for the week. Well, hey there, listeners. Confusion is not magic. Did y'all catch that gem that Jonathan tucked in there? Attributed to a variety of master magicians, that one quote really got me thinking. Now, I've long encouraged my clients to write taglines or elevator pitches that are, as I call it, enticingly vague. Don't tell them that you teach second grade math at the Academy of the Sacred Heart in St. Charles, Missouri, right off the bat, for example. If you just say, I'm a teacher, you beg for participation in the form of following questions. A little confusion is a beautiful thing, I would say. But now I realize I've been wrong and that confusion is not the right word. Although we want to perplex, delight, and educate our audiences, it's curiosity we're aiming at. Attention, not confusion. 
And now that that clicks into place in my head, I can prove it to myself with my own experience. The movies, plot lines, methodologies that lose me are the ones that confuse me. I mean, hell, I'll commit to a boring journey if I believe that the payoff is going to be good. So let's make sure we aren't confusing our potential clients. Are we using industry jargon that is second nature to us, but Greek to them? I'm looking at you, my beloved human design folks. You can't sell a program to Manny Jens until they understand what the heck a manifesting generator is. Wait, no, even further, until they understand what human design is. When I rebranded my business to the Non-Sleazy Sales Academy, I chose to define sleaze and sales for myself. And you can find those definitions on my website to this day. Why? Because they clear stuff up that I hadn't realized were not necessarily uniformly understood. That way we can all get on the same page. It's not about detailing every ingredient in your secret sauce. Your methods are your own, as are your details. But this week, your homework is to interview your loved ones and friends about what it is you do. Bonus points awarded for asking kids. My own favorite kid said, Annie, you boss people around for a living. He's not wrong. So ask your loved ones the following. Number one, hey, what is it that I do for work? Number two, what kinds of people do I help? Number three, why would someone choose to hire me or buy from me? And number four, what confuses you about what I do? If your loved ones are lost, odds are your clients are too. Most of us are selling transformation in one way or another. We don't need them to understand every landmark along the way, but we do need to be sure that they understand our directions. Too Legitimate to Quit is brought to you by the Non-Sleazy Sales Academy and me, Annie P. Ruggles. What if you never had to sell alone again? If you always felt safe and seen and supported in selling situations because you only had to show up as your best and also most ordinary self. You can profit just by being you without one gimmick, one inch of sleaze. To find out more about our membership, visit www.nonsleazy.com. That's N-O-N-S-L-E-A-Z-Y. Com. Too Legitimate to Quit is written and hosted by me, Annie Passanisi Ruggles. Our editor and producer is Andrew Sims of Hypable. Our incredible earworm of a theme tune was composed and performed by Riley Horbasio. Our beautiful show art is by Francois Vigno. And my beautiful, wonderful, amazing creative director, Georgia Curran, handles my social media accounts with care. Listen, I would love to hear from you. I'd love to hear how your homework is going, what you think of the show, or what topics you'd love to see covered here. Feel free to reach out to me on any platform with messaging, but the best for me are LinkedIn, where you'll find me under my name, Annie P. Ruggles, or on Instagram, where you'll find me at Anniepreneur. And please don't forget to send this show to people that you think would benefit or to drop us a review wherever you listen to podcasts that really helps our show grow. Until next week, remember, you're too legit to quit. <laughs>